So let's finish up these slides on risks and bugs, and then we'll start some new ones. I am excited. So yeah, last time we ended talking about like, oh man, bad things can happen with programs. Uh-oh. Uh, we can hurt people in real life with programs. That's a bad, bad thing. How can we maybe somehow fix that? How can we keep our programs from doing bad things? One way is testing. So we write a bunch of test cases where we say, okay, here is what I expect to have happen when I run my code on these particular inputs. I better get this answer back. And uh, a test is just going and running the code in your mind and making sure that it gives back what you thought it should give back for a bunch of different cases. And hopefully with enough cases, you can gain some pretty good confidence that your program is going to work perfectly, if not mostly perfectly. Okay, so that is testing. But the sad thing is you can't make every test in the world, right? You can't catch every single bug there is. You can't try your code on every single number that exists, can you? You can't, like, make a test. Okay, does it work for one? Okay, does it work for two? Okay, does it work for three? Because there's an infinite number of numbers. And so we'll never be perfectly confident that it always works, right? That's a little weird. There's another way to do that. Let me show you that. If you use math instead, you can prove that for your infinity of number inputs, it's always going to be correct. This is pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways to make correct software from the start, and some of them involve lots of math. Okay? So, uh, one easy way to make... Uh, some software that you can trust a little bit better than the base version would be if you write two versions of the same program. This is maybe what, what goes on inside of a plane, inside of an autopilot system. They have two versions of the same program written by other people, different people each time, and they're both trying to control the airplane. They're both like, okay, we should turn left. Okay, we should turn right. And we need to see if they agree. There's redundancy going on. So each program is checking the other one's outputs. So just give the same contract to two different development corporations, have them make you the same program, and make sure they agree on their output. Like, okay, the plane should turn left. Okay, the plane should turn right. That's helpful. Programs that check their outputs, make sure that the output is correct before they give it to the plane to execute, right? Something like that. You could also write a proof. A proof that your program's always going to do the right thing, and uh, you'll have to wait until CSI 26 to, to write those, but that's pretty powerful. You can mathematically say, like, your program's never going to do anything wrong. Uh, let me give you a, just a taste of what that would be like, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that a program does exactly something. Like, here are two very simple lines of code, right? X equals 42, X equals X plus 1, Python code. You can mathematically specify, and I think it's pretty obvious to see that after that second line, x is always going to be 43, right? That's the kind of reasoning you would expand upon. x is totally 43 here. And I think you can imagine that there's a lot more math that could be involved here that makes sure, like, if blocks do the right thing, if, one, if we go one way or another way, the loop block always does the right thing after it completes the iteration of its loop. All that kind of stuff. Not something you can mathematically specify. Make sure that your program will never do something wrong by proving the answer that I get after I run all these lines mathematically must be this. And that's a beautiful thing. All right? Yeah, let me if you have any questions about this stuff. Uh, kind of hand in hand with proofs, you have these things called analyzers. Analyzers are proved to be correct. So that's why they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, what a program analysis does is it runs your program not to get an answer, but it kind of like runs it in math. And it sees if there's any issues. Like, I'm going to run your program, but I don't trust it. I'm going to see if it's going to accidentally connect to the internet and try to go to some website that I don't trust. Something like that. That's what an analyzer can check for. You can give it something that you want to see happen, and it will tell you, yeah, I think that's probably going to happen, or no, that might not happen. Something like that. So... Proof is the most powerful, then analyzers are like the next most powerful. It runs your program, sees what it might do, the kind of outputs that it might have, 
And then there's also the idea of a specification, because at the end of the day, you have to say to somebody what the program should do. At least you have to convince yourself that you understand what the program should do, right? You have to specify exactly what should happen in your program. And so there's plenty of people that sit all day long and they write requirements for every program, like the requirement. Here's a sample one. You could write the requirement that, okay, the output to my fancy flight control software better always be greater than 42. Should always be greater than or equal to 42 or something. You have to get the requirements right to write the code correctly. Do you see how that's important as well? So there's special specification languages. One is called Z because it was invented by Europeans. Uh, and those, they don't like prove that something is correct. They just specify like, okay, this is what should happen in this situation. This is what the output should uh, adhere to. So you say what's supposed to be done in your specification language, and then you use one of these methods, like a proof or an analyzer analysis, to make sure that those things that you're specifying are actually going to happen. Okay? So that's like very, very important as well. You have to at least specify what your program should do, right? Everything. You have to specify up front exact, exactly what your program does and or can do. Because otherwise, if you write the proof for a wrong specification, like what's the point? The program won't even be what you expected. So you have to specify exactly what your program sh must do or could do in every case. Leave nothing to chance, okay? And then the issue there is, of course, that your specification can be wrong. Like, oh no, I say I require that the output should always be greater than or equal to 42, but really it's supposed to be always greater than or equal to zero, something like that. Like, there's a bug in your requirement now, and if you go ask programmers to write this kind of code and prove that it's correct, oh no, it might be wrong. Maybe it was supposed to be greater than or equal to 50. So this is all a bit vague and generic, but I hope it makes a little bit of sense. If you want your software to be correct, you have to write down exactly what it should do. You could get that writing down wrong, and then you have to go use some kind of method to confirm that it's going to do that thing. Okay? You can use full-blown math if you need to, and it's possible, right? This is definitely used in practice, these ideas, when you have very safety-critical software, like a flight control system, like uh, other things, like NASA, would probably use a lot of proofs and analyses. Okay? So if that makes enough sense. And here's one of the most popular uh, programs that lets you prove things about other programs written by some French people. So yeah, well, I have some examples now of uh, just software that's trying to make our lives a little bit easier. I have some more examples of that. So here's one uh, from the book, I think, about air traffic control. So when you're in a plane, you have to talk to a human on the ground telling you what to do, right? Turn left, turn right, get ready to land, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there was this fun piece of uh, software that, that was released one day called the Traffic Collision Avoidance System. So if you're flying in your plane, you have to have this now, uh, or TCAS for short. And it was able to like use the readings from planes that are flying next to each other, because those all have to send out a signal to each other, right? That uh, the system could tell if two planes were about to hit each other, and it would tell the pilots how to avoid that collision. It would be like, okay, this plane over here, here's my best drawing of a plane, is getting way too close to this plane over here, and like lights are going to flash, alarms are going to ring, and it's going to say, uh, okay, plane over here, decrease altitude. Plane over here, increase altitude, or turn left, turn right, all that kind of stuff. It would tell the pilots how to avoid the potential collision. That's very useful to have, right? So, unfortunately, this was kind of like the program that cried wolf. So, uh, the original version of the software is a little too, uh, too worrisome, I would say. It had a bunch of false alarms. Like, it thought two planes that were way far away from each other were going to hit each other. And so, pilots stopped listening to those alarms. Okay? That's unfortunate. 
But eventually, they got the warnings down to be perfect, like they, they always fired their uh, alarm when it should have been a real issue. And so eventually it got so good that it was perfectly accurate. And sadly, a collision happened because one pilot in one of the planes listened to the software, listened to the traffic collision avoidance system telling it to like increase altitude or something. But the other one, the other plane, didn't listen to it. It followed whatever the air traffic controller on the ground was saying instead. And so, unfortunately, the air traffic controller told the second plane to do the same thing as the software told to the first plane, and they ended up crashing. Okay? Which is quite sad. But, uh, yeah. Now, every, uh, everyone who uses this thing must disobey the human. The law now is you have to disobey the air traffic controller and trust the TCOS system. It will always be correct. It will always do the right thing. And so uh, people's lives are kind of at stake with this thing. This is a piece of software that's keeping us safe when we're flying in airplanes. Okay? It's better than the human. We have to disobey the human now. But it started with a buggy little piece of software, right? It, it was giving a lot of false alarms. It wasn't perfect, but it got to be there. That's maybe what we, we dream to happen to all of our software, right? Make it's good, good enough to be used by everyone. But yeah, we are now forced to depend on this software. It is now the law. Any questions, comments about that? It's, just an, it's an interesting thing, right? We're required to use this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's always best, I would say, in this situation. Like people stop trusting it because of it. They're like, oh, I don't need to move. I'm fine. That's a good point. Yeah, it's better than it accidentally not telling you to move. That's for sure. You want a lot of false alarms. Any other questions, comments about this stuff? So we we now re rely on this software. I'm sure you rely on a lot of software in your life. You're forced to use some, like you're forced to use whatever the new version of WebAdvisor is to sign up for a class, right? You can't do anything else any other way. So you're kind of forced to use a lot of software, even if you have never heard of it. Somebody's using it for you. Uh, so I have a little question for you now. Let's get into groups and talk about this. Here is our debate for the day. Again, let's have you as a group write down one argument for and one argument against this time so that you think about both angles. So please go to the written ice page and I'll clear it out. But your question is about depending on computers. Do we depend on computers too much? Should we, should we not be depending on those computers? So here's your debate question. Do we depend on computers too, too much? Maybe we should have them be less impactful in our lives. Maybe we should have them be more impactful in our lives. So try to come up with one argument for and one argument against, please. I'll give you a few minutes to talk about that. Yeah. 
Take another minute or so to get some stuff in. <laughs> All right, that is my alarm. Let's come back and discuss what we wrote down. Hmm. All right, let's see what we're thinking. So I want to see some arguments like, yes, we do, or no, we don't. Very nice. So if the power goes out, they're doing some work on my street right now. I might not be able to respond to your questions, right? If my power goes out and I don't have access to internet anymore. You can put a stop to everything. Your, your work, your school, all that stuff. We should depend on computers more for record taking, mathematical calculations. Yeah, some things computers are really good at. That's a great point. They have no errors. Computers can't mess up like a human could mess up. Plug it in numbers into a calculator, right? That's a great, great point. Yeah, but uh, sometimes we need humans to arrange data in a different way. Yeah, there's some things that computers aren't good at. I like that, group 24, very nice. Yeah, group 20 during COVID. Yeah, that's a great example. COVID kind of required us to go online for a lot of stuff. And if we didn't have that, we were kind of like cut off from the entire world. And that was a great, great thing to have. I like these ideas. We do depend on, yeah, the internet a little much. Yeah, we're, we're even using the internet for this class. I'm requiring you to use the internet for this class, aren't I? But yeah, maybe that is a bad thing. Now that you know that information is always immediately available, it's it's a lot harder to learn stuff and hold on to facts in your mind because you know it's always just a Google away. That's a great point. Uh, some things we're not allowed to use computers on. Surgery. Self-driving cars are not yet allowed to be fully self-driving. There always needs to be a, a human behind the wheel. That's a great point. Yeah, some things humans are still a lot better at. But maybe one day that might change. I like it, yeah. We require computers for entertainment, for weapons, all these things. Well, these are great points. There's so many other ways. Other things that could 
happen. A lot of laborful jobs, other th yeah, things that still require humans exist. A lot of professions, for example. Maybe one day that'll change. always like trust but make sure that it's working write a write a proof run it through an analysis that your program's correct yeah i like these ideas our infrastructure is relying on computers if a meteor hit the the internet or something somehow we could still live right we'd still find a way to make things work but i think yeah our life is a bit easier because we have computers very nice yeah any other questions, comments about this stuff? I like our responses here. There, there's definitely two sides to the coin, and I'm glad we, we noticed that. It's important to notice. All right. I think I'm good to continue if we are. So, yeah, let's, let's keep on trucking then. Uh, yeah, with the air traffic controller example, like maybe we need to depend on computers more. Who knows? But... When in doubt, we can always ask our boys, right? We could ask Kant, like, hey, should we always be using computers to solve our problems, right? And I think Kant would totally say no. Like, you shouldn't be required to use something if you don't want to. You don't have to. You don't want to use a computer to, I don't know, write a note for yourself. Nobody's forcing you to type it up, right? You can just write it down. This, you don't have to use a computer if you don't want to. I think Kant would be pro whatever you need, right? And then Mill would maybe say yes. I think I could probably most easy, easily uh, prove that Mill would, would say yes. Like, it's pretty obvious that if we didn't have computers and this kind of technology that we have today, we would have, like, our quality of life would not be as good. I think that's, it's pretty agreed upon that the quality of life today is a lot better than it was like a few decades ago. And part of that is by, uh, is thanks to all the technology that we have uh, and all the computers that we've developed in the, in the meantime. Okay. Yeah. So that's my thinking there. Uh, again, you can come up with your own response. Uh, there's also the question of do computers make us safer? Cause we we've talked about like bad things that can happen and, things that computers are good at for helping us. But I think there are some, some ways that computers do keep us safe, right? In addition to this TCAS airplane system, autopilot stuff, uh, and autopilot itself, uh, there's like in cars, right? You have a little computer in your brakes, right? You have ABS, if you have a, a recent car at least. Uh, and that's going to stop you sooner if you have to slam on the brakes, right? It's going to make it so that you're... you're your tires don't skid. There's also the concept of the check engine light, which involves a little mini computer inside of your car, right? It runs some tests as your car starts up to make sure something isn't horribly wrong, and it alerts you. Even if it can't say what, it just tells you to go get that figured out as soon as possible, right? Uh, home security systems are pretty popular these days, I would say. A lot of people uh, set up cameras, and that can deter people from who might want to break in or vandalize or whatever. Uh, I think before electronics, the, the best security system was like a dog, right? Maybe uh, we haven't yet come full circle, but we're doing pretty well with the cameras nowadays. Uh, yeah, our phones are locked with a passcode, so people can't get access to our personal information. If you, uh, if you were storing personal information just in your house or something behind a locked door... Uh, that's a lot easier to get into than an encrypted password, right? So I think there's some safety involved there. And of course, we have some things online that are very, very important to be hidden, right? Like we log into our bank software, our bank app, and that software is supposed to make sure that we are the people who are logging in, like we are the actual owner of that account. Right? So there's like two-factor authentication, if you log in from a new device, all that kind of stuff that's trying to keep us safe and keep our money our money, right? Something like that. So I think there are some, there's a lot of arguments for technology and for computers, and obviously I'm biased because I'm teaching a computer science class, but I think uh, our lives are a bit improved by them. 
That's why I study them. Any questions, comments about this stuff before we switch gears to something else? A bit lighter uh, of topics in the next slides, at least. Yeah, the next thing I want to talk about then is artificial intelligence. I don't see where am I going with this. I have a few examples, but we'll get there. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning at the same time, essentially, because machine learning, I would, I would argue, is a subfield of artificial intelligence. But the first thing I want to talk about is like why our computers are so good these days and why they used to be so slow. Okay, so I want to answer the question like how fast are computers getting faster? If you haven't seen this before, it has to do with something called Moore's Law that you can look up. It's a great Wikipedia page about this. But here was uh, an observation that a man named Gordon Moore noticed back in the 60s, I think. Uh, this man, by the way, if you haven't heard the name before, he was the co-founder of Intel, and I have a feeling you've heard of them before. So, yeah, what he noticed was, okay, the number of transistors in a chip that we make for a CPU, etc., uh, they seem to double every two years. So, let's say in year, year one, there was one transistor in the chip, then year two, or year zero, there was one transistor in the chip. Year two, there were two transistors in the chip. Then year four, there would be four transistors. Or year, yeah, year four, there would be four transistors. Then year six, there would be eight. They would keep doubling, one, two, four, eight, every two years, that kind of thing. So that was what he noticed, and that's, that's exponential growth, right? Doubles every two years. Uh, and for a long time, this meant that computers got twice as fast every two years, because if you jam more transistors in a chip, that usually corresponds to more processing potential, more power to, to do stuff with. And so that was pretty nice. The, the number of transistors kind of went hand in hand with the speed of a computer, and the speed of the computer is measured in hertz, the clock speed that maybe if you've built a, a PC or if you've, like, you've looked in uh, the preferences of your computer or something, you've noticed like, okay, I have a 4 gigahertz CPU or something. Each core has 4 gigahertz, something like that. Uh, that's what it means. That's how fast it is. This means it can do 4 billion instructions a second. That's how you parse that. That's what... That means, if you've heard of it but didn't know what, the four billions of giga means billion, so four billion instructions a second. Okay, that's a lot of things that it can process. Uh, but it just so happened that Moore's law is not really that true anymore. It is starting to fail, and we're finding harder. We're finding it harder and harder to jam more transistors into a chip. Okay, eventually we started running into power limits for processors the second bullet started becoming false because most of our CPUs, they max out at around four gigahertz. You've never seen like an eight gigahertz CPU on sale, right? And it's been years that it's been stuck at four gigahertz, right? The issue is there's a power wall. You would have to dissipate so much heat to have an eight gigahertz CPU. You'd have to like cool it with liquid nitrogen or something. That's the only way people are getting those readings. So there's a power limit there. You need to shove a lot of power into a processor if you want it to run that fast. Okay, and people still wanted to put more transistors into a chip. They st still figure out how to make transistors smaller, but computers weren't getting any faster. Uh, and so they had to think of a different way to do this. The solution was, okay, we have power limits. We can't make a single CPU chip faster. So how about we put a bunch of CPUs in your CPU? That's when the multi-core era became a thing. So now you buy a computer, it has like four cores in the processor, eight cores in the processor. That's the idea. And so it's got little mini CPUs inside of your big CPU. At least that's how I want you to think about it. You'll have to wait until CSI 45 to learn more about this stuff. But yeah, here's like your chip. You can now put like four cores that are each, I don't know, 2.5 gigahertz or something normal. That's probably what this laptop has. Uh, and then you can still run four times the software because each little mini CPU can run its own little program. That's essentially how it works. Okay, so multi-core software became a thing and that is still getting us some speed up because you can run four programs at the same time. We can't make the cores themselves any faster, 
but we can still increase the number of transistors pretty well these days. We just have to expand, add more cores. Okay. Eventually, Moore's law is going to fail in total. It's we're not going to be able to make transistors any smaller anymore uh, because we're getting down to like atomic issues. Like electrons are starting to like flee from the the wires because they're getting so small. Uh, so eventually, it's going to fail. But we're still having some fun with Moore's law. Here's the fun picture that's on the Wikipedia page. Uh, if you're knowledgeable about any old CPU history, it's a fun thing to look at. Oh, by the way, uh, let me explain the graph axes. So here is the axes of the graph every two years. Oh, oh. And uh, here is the number of transistors in the chip. There's going to be a bunch of CPUs on, on the graph. And here's the transistor count of those, uh, of those CPU chips. And first of all, notice that this is a log axis. So it's doubling 50 to 100,000 to 500,000 to 1 million. So this is a log scale. So if you see a trend line that is a line, and there is a trend line that is a line, right? It's, it's this one. Whee! That means it's an exponential growth, right? Because it's a, a log scale. So if we zoom in here, we'll see some CPUs that are like the, the original ones. You have some original Intel CPUs that were like not even 5,000 transistors that were still running code. Crazy to think about. You have original ARM processors, which are trying to compete with Intel processors that had over a magnitude more transistors, but were still running at the same speed, doing just as cool stuff. That's beautiful. We have ARM processors in our phones these days. Uh, Motorola 6800, very, very popular uh, in early Apple computers. I believe. And so these like these processors, they started the personal computing era, and they didn't even have 500,000 transistors inside of them. They were very slow, but they were still working for the people of the time. And so if we, we zoom on over here, we have, we start getting like 10 million transistors, 100 million transistors. You have the Pentium processors, if you've heard of those before. And then the time we started hitting the power wall was around the early 2000s or mid-2000s. Mid That's when these core words started popping up. We started putting more cores inside of our chips because that was the only way to increase the number of transistors uh, without like blowing up our CPUs and requiring like li liquid nitrogen to cool them. And so, yeah, these days we have about uh, 10 billion transistors inside of a chip. And we're trying to make that even bigger if we can. These are like giant server-sized processors, 72 core things with billions of transistors. But look at the look at where we started. Those were able to run things. I cared about running just with 5,000 transistors or so. It's crazy. Yeah. So this is Moore's law. There is a trend line that is. A line, and so this is exponential growth. It's still happening, but one day it's going to slow down, sadly. We will have squeezed all that we can out of physics. Any questions about that? Have you heard of that before, maybe? Moore's Law? Looks like my water bottle is leaking. Oh no. So, yeah, that's a fun little topic. Uh, and this. Making programs faster, increasing the number of transistors, is definitely the reason that artificial intelligence is getting a lot more popular these days, because we have more processing power to throw at artificial intelligence algorithms. Okay, so let me try to teach you like how computers think, and I'll tell you how good they are at it too, if I can. So yeah, let me define artificial intelligence for you. This is a fun topic for me to talk about, at least it's... Very exciting. I'm sure you've seen some of the examples, and I'll have you try some of the examples in class of, of some artificial intelligence algorithms or some machine learning algorithms uh, specifically. So artificial intelligence, AI for short, is just, okay, let's make a machine have some concept of thinking, of thought, of s sentience, right? So it's when you make a program that perceives its environment somehow, maybe through sensors, and it makes choices based on the environment that it senses, right? Like move this way, move that way, that kind of thing. And there's always an underlying goal, like, I don't know, 
reproduce or get to the corner of the room or something. And so this is a very utilitarian way of writing software, I would say, artificial intelligence software. You have a program, you don't teach it how to do something, you tell it, all right, here's how you look at the world, here's a little webcam for you, here is like a, a sonar sensor so you can tell how far away things are. Uh, okay, now go and make choices, here's the goal that I've programmed for you to, to achieve. Figure out how to do it. That's pretty cool. So that's artificial intelligence in a nutshell. There's plenty of sub areas of artificial intelligence that you can study. There's robotics, of course, like you make a, a physical robot, you give it some artificial intelligence software to go and do something like dance around. You've seen those cool YouTube videos of, of the company called Boston Dynamics. They, they make these weird looking robots that just move so gracefully or not so gracefully. But they do really cool stuff. So look that up if you're interested and you haven't seen it. Like they had a little Christmas videos or something that were cute. Uh, but that's one thing. There's also machine learning. There's the idea of face recognition. Like I have to unlock my phone with my face these days, right? Uh, among other things. I'll tell you plenty more examples. There's a lot more that are popular these days. And I'll give you some more. Uh, most machine learning these days is happening using what are called neural networks. That's a specific machine learning algorithm, a way of performing machine learning. You model a brain, right? Neural. So that's pretty fun. We'll talk about that. And yeah, really, at the end of the day, uh, artificial intelligence is really just a lot of statistics. It's like, okay, I have all this data. Let me analyze it in software and use that to predict something or tell my little robot what to do. It's really just glorified statistics, okay? Don't let any, anybody tell you otherwise. That's essentially artificial intelligence. You have to learn a lot of statistics, a lot of linear algebra. It's a lot of math, but it can do some really cool stuff, okay? Any questions about this before I give you some examples of artificial intelligence and machine learning? Yeah, so I think that's that's pretty much the rest of today. Some examples that I'll have you play around with should be fun, especially if you haven't tried them before. So probably the earliest example of artificial intelligence that like a lot of people interacted with that I can remember is remember those original digital cameras? If those still exist, I don't even know. But they had screens on the back that like you can look through it and see what the picture was going to be, and it could figure out if somebody was blinking in the picture. That is artificial intelligence. Blink detection. That is very common. Uh, it was so simple you could put it inside of a camera chip. Uh, but yeah, it is a machine learning technique. Uh, let me kind of explain. Um, gosh, how, how do I want to do this? I'll have to come back to this, this idea. But uh, yeah, blink detection. It's a machine learning technique. There's the idea, all right, all right, I have my sensor. I have, a, I have an image, and I have a person in that image, maybe multiple people. Here's my person. I have to figure out, like, okay, uh, and let's say that they, are, they have their eyes open or something. I have to notice where their eyes are. Like, I have to find their face. I have to find the eyes. I have to check whether or not the eyes are open or closed. Like, that seems like a very complicated program to write, yeah? So let me teach you how you would make a blink detection algorithm. Let me try my best, okay? I want to teach you in general, this is a concept of machine learning, by the way, teaching a computer to do something without explicitly telling it how. Let me teach you that in general with that as an example. So how does machine learning work in general, okay? So I have made the idea of there are three steps, uh, and let me try and explain that for you with, uh, with the blink detection as an example, okay? So the step one for trying to make a program that learns how to do something is you have to give it a bunch of data. You have to give it a bunch of pictures of people if you're making a, a blink detection algorithm. You have to give it what, a bunch of what's called training data that it will learn from, right? It needs to be taught. And you're going to label that data with what you want your machine learning program to learn. The standard term for your machine learning program is your model. The model of the world or something. So you're going to give, you're going you're gonna to take a bunch of pictures of people, right? You're going to give a bunch of pictures of people, uh, some with their eyes open, and you'll label that, like, okay, this picture ha has a person in it, and their eyes are open. Eyes open. And then you give it a bunch of pictures of people 
with their eyes closed, like here's their eyes closed. And you give like millions of those pictures to your machine learning algorithm and it learns to differentiate between them. That's the beauty of it, right? You also have to give it a bunch of pictures of things without faces, right? Because it might just be like, okay, eyes are closed, eyes are open. If you give it the picture of an airplane. So you have to give it a bunch of pictures of faces and non-faces, right? There's an airplane or face, give both, right? And you'll label them, right? You'll label it like, okay, their eyes open, their eyes closed, there's no, no face in this picture, something like that. And so you'll give like millions of pictures just like that, all right? So for example, if you want to notice faces, you'll give it a bunch of labeled pictures with faces and non-faces. And for the ones with faces in it, you'll also label it whether or not the eyes were open or they were closed. Okay? Something like that. So that is your step one. That's usually the hardest part. Get a bunch of training data. The rest is kind of automatic, right? Step two is train your model, train your machine learning program using some machine learning technique. It's like something that's able to take the training data and learn from that training data, right? One way to do it is called a neural network, which models a human brain or just an animal brain in software. We'll talk about that. Uh, but yeah, you have to give it a bunch of data and you have to keep having it train itself on that data. Usually your model is horrible the first time you run it, like it has random values, it gives random output. You have to keep running it and having it correct itself, right? There's a way for each technique, there's a way of having it correct itself and learn a little bit better each time, okay? It's very generic. Uh, that's as, as deep as I can go in this class, I would say. Uh, and then finally, once you have your model and it's performing really well on your training data, then you test it. You test it on some separate data, some separate label data, but you don't give it the labels. You test it and you make sure that it's getting those things right most of the time and making sure that it didn't just memorize the training data. Like, okay, this picture has a face right here. I can just remember the green, the green background or something and I'll just predict that the eyes are open. No, it needs to actually learn about the faces and the eyes, okay? So that's why you set aside some data, some labeled data, and you make sure your model is actually working on that data as well, okay? Make sure it's getting things right most of the time, not just memorizing things. Uh, and yeah, I usually use a neural network for this, which models the way that neurons work in a brain. Like you give it some, some input and it like gives some neural signals to different neurons. These circles are supposed to mean neurons and it just propagates that information to the end, and it's supposed to like predict like in the final neuron, oh, that was there was, a, there was a face, their eyes were open, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that is my best effort at explaining to you what machine learning is in a single slide, when in reality it would take you a few classes few upper division classes to fully understand it. Are there any questions about it, about this process? It's just there is a way to take data that has been labeled and learn from it. Learn to differentiate a face just automatically based on the pixel data. It'll figure out what a face is. If you give it enough pictures of faces and non-faces, it'll just figure it out. It'll find it there, okay? And you keep testing it. Uh, and so usually the hard part is getting a bunch of training data. The more data you have, the better your model can be. And so uh, if you remember like why Google Photos used to be free, they were trying to learn from all of the pictures that you uploaded to it. They were training their uh, machine learning algorithms. And that's partially the reason why like Facebook lets you upload as many pictures as you want, right? So they can train their machine learning algorithms on it. Because usually you'll tag people, you'll say where you were, and that'll help. Any questions about that? All right, because I have some fun stuff for you to try if you haven't tried it before. Uh, so please first go to this website, and we'll, you can share your fun stuff if you'd like to. Uh, it's called crayon.com, www.crayon.com, but instead of uh, the normal way of spelling it, right, It's there's AI in the word crayon, crayon, C-R-A-I-Y-O-N.com. Please go here, and... Enter any prompt you want. What do you want it to draw for you? Have it, has anyone seen this before? There's like entire Twitter accounts dedicated to running this on weird prompts. But I don't know, like a cat staring longingly 
into the sunset. Something like that. And it'll just go and draw you a picture of that. It'll draw you actually nine pictures of that. All of arbitrary goodnesses. But this is super powerful. And this is very popular recently. This, this technology has only been out for a very little while. And so you can legitimately type anything up here. Probably the funniest one that I have seen is uh, somebody typed a, fun uh, a funeral in Whole Foods. And it just drew that. It's hilarious. But it takes some time and has to think. And so try a few examples of this. But uh, once it works, I want you to think about in the background of your mind, like what kind of training data do you think was given to this program? Like what did they have to give it for it to be able to draw stuff from your responses. And so look at how cute this is. Little cat staring into the sunset. None of these pictures exist. Some of them are a little creepy, but like none of these pictures are real. It's coming up with them. That one's not staring in the right direction. Maybe that's the best one. And people are saying that this is like going to, to ruin artists or something. It's going to make artists not need to be artists anymore or something like that which is probably not true, but this can legitimately take your text and draw a picture from it. So what kinds of uh, training data do you think was being used here as you try phone prompts? What do you think it needed to be able to take your text and make pictures from it? Any ideas? It's a little too complicated, maybe. But I don't think so, because you just give it a bunch of pictures, right? You give it a bunch of pictures, and all those pictures are labeled. Like, okay, this is a picture of a cat laying on the ground. You just give a very detailed description of the picture with the picture. If you give billions of those, eventually you can learn to parse the text, right? in a certain way, figure out, like, okay, this is what it means to be a cat. All these labels have a cat in it in different orientations. Okay, and so it's learning what it means to be a cat. It's learning what it means to be a sunset. There's a billion pictures with sunsets in it. It's like, okay, this is what a sunset looks like. There's a circle. It's pretty bright. There's some cool orangey, yellowish colors. So it's learning what all these words mean together. And so it's essentially learning to speak. And it's also learning to draw. It can go in the reverse way. It's like, you give me a text prompt, I will draw for you what I think that means. And all it is is it's trained with a bunch of pictures of things that have been labeled by humans. Very detailed labels, though. Does that make sense to us? You give it to something and it will, it will learn that. So you could play around with this for so long. And I encourage you to. Uh, but I have another example for you next, if we're good to move on. This one is actually what's going on uh, deep down. So this website and a lot of other machine learning algorithms, they're all using these things called neural networks, which model what a brain really does. And so here is a website that will teach you how neural networks work. It's called playground.tensorflow.org. Uh, it's a bit of a long thing to type, so maybe I can try to type it in the uh, in the crushed ice page. Here, I'll just put it up here at the top. If you want to click on it here, so you probably already have this open. Oh, that's huge. Uh, let me delete the formatting. But there it is, if you want it. Uh, please go here, and I'll try to teach you what it means to be a neural network. So this is not as cool, of course, as drawing cats. But let me try and explain what a neural network is now. Let's see here, where do I want to be? Here. So a neural network is trying to model a brain. Okay, It's trying to, to model the way that a brain is interacting with information. So you have a bunch of like neurons, right? These are all the little circles in my little diagram. And 
those neurons are connected to other neurons. And so, like, if I see something, there, are, uh, my eyes are eventually sending electrical signals to neurons in my brain, and that's having things fire up, right? It's having me be able to look at this picture and see a cat or something, right? Something like that. So that's what neurons are all about. They're about propagating information. So there's some inputs, and there's like a whole network of them. They're all connected to each other. And maybe, inside of a computer program at least, we have some output neurons, like ones that we look at to, to figure out the answer with. Okay? So that's the idea of a neural network. It's just a bunch of little neurons connected to each other. And let's pretend, like, instead of sending electrical signals, they're sending numbers to each other. Like, they're sending, like, the input was 1.0. It's doing some stuff with 1.0. Like, now it's 2.0. Over here, it's negative 5.5. And it's like combining them in a special way to, to make like a fancy number. So like maybe this is like 3.3. .3. And you can learn like if the output neuron is greater than zero, it means the face had it eyes open in it or something. If the output neuron was less than zero, that meant that the face had its eyes closed, something like that. And so it's just propagating numbers. And that's really what is doing all this learning. Even this fancy thing, it's using a neural network deep down. Okay? So I'm going to give you some general idea of what a neural network is. And here is a fun little playground for neural networks. So here is your neural network. You have all these little neurons. These are input neurons. Uh, your goal of your machine learning program is to differentiate the blue dots from the orange dots. Okay. It's, you need to learn. You need to figure out how to learn the difference between the blue dots and the orange dots. And here are your inputs. They are labeled in a weird way. This x1 is the x-coordinate of your dot. You're given just the location of the dot, and you're trying to learn if it's blue or orange. So x1 is the x-coordinate of the dot. x2 is the y-coordinate of the dot. And these are very horribly labeled, but x1, 2 is really x1 squared. So it's the x-coordinate squared. This is the y-coordinate squared. This is x1 times. This is the x-coordinate times the y-coordinate of the point. This is the sine of the x-coordinate of the point, the sine of the y-coordinate of the point. And so these are a bunch of neurons. These are your input neurons. Here is weird combinations of those neurons. These are called hidden layers. You can add some more hidden layers if you want, but you can add as many as you need. Two, three, up to like maybe eight hidden layers. I don't know, six hidden layers. Play around with that. And then there's an idea of an output layer. It's, it's going to say like positive or negative. So if it's negative, it thinks it's orange. If it's positive, it thinks it's blue. And with enough neurons and enough information as input and enough ways of propagating that information, you can press play and have it learn the difference between blue and orange. Does that make any sense at all? So it's trying to come up with essentially a mathematical formula for what separates the two, the two groups. Okay? Does that make enough sense? And so usually, I mean... Definitely play around with this as I'm talking about it. If you add a million hidden layers, and you add a million features, and you add as many things as possible, it's always going to learn it eventually. But it might what's called overfit, which is no fun. It might just be memorizing the data at that point. But you can just do overkill, and it'll figure out what's going on here, just very slowly. Uh, but it's trying to learn that there's a circle differentiating these things. Does that make sense? It's trying to learn what it means to be a circle. And you can see on each edge, there's a weight involved. So like some of these are thicker than others. And so it's saying like, I'm getting a lot of my information from these guys. These two are the most important neurons to me. For my output. This one down here is a very weak neuron. Very Learning the importance of them. The importance of which neurons matter, which is really fun, right? And so you can play around with that. Uh, probably keep all the things up top the same. But uh, can I reload this and make it default again? Let me try to get it back to normal. Because if you're having fun with that one, try to pick the features and enough neurons to, to have it do this one. Have it differentiate these over here, this, this data set. These blue ones from these orange ones. These blue ones from these orange ones. And then these blue ones from these orange ones. There's four different ones. So play around with that for a minute or two. 
and then I'll show you a secret. I'll show you a trick to make it always the best. And it requires thinking about your data. So can you pick the right features? Can you pick the right number of neurons in the middle to be able to differentiate these guys or these guys or these guys? Help each other as you learn how. But it's all about learning how to differentiate, how to hook up the, these inputs. They're just x and y coordinates or x coordinate squared, things like that, to intermediate stages. I'm propagating like x1 plus x2 over here, just x2 over here. It's trying to make a mathematical formula to combine those things. It's trying to learn these weights. That's all machine learning is these days. Are there any questions about any of, what, any of the words I'm saying? So I can get more, more specific if you're interested. So yeah, it's trying to come up with a fancy formula for like what differentiates these things. So first of all, the thing that differentiates this first input set is a circle, right? You just draw a circle here. Is anything on the inside is blue, anything on the outside is orange? Does anybody remember the mathematical equation for a circle? What is it? How would you graph a circle? What is the what's the equation? Does no one remember? Equation of a circle. Come on, guys. I believe in you. Well, that's a little too complicated. That's equation of like an oval. Uh, it's supposed to just be x squared plus y squared equals r squared, right? I guess this is a this is too fancy. This is with a sp specific center. But it's x squared plus y squared equals r squared, right? That would be a, a circle centered at 0, 0. Here is the x squared bit, x squared feature, y squared feature. It'll just learn a circle. I don't even need any hidden layers. Play. It learns a perfect circle from that. And loss means how bad it was on the test data. It does it perfectly. Isn't that nice? So if you think about your data, you can eventually come up with the right with the right answer here. Same with this one. Do I want to get the minimum number of features, or do we just like press plus a bunch of times? Because I think if you just multiply right x1 and x2, you'll figure out the difference, right? Because it's either they're in the first or third quadrant where there is, uh, they're either both positive or both negative. If you multiply those two coordinates, the x and y together, you get a positive number, something like that. Otherwise, you're over here. Yeah, so that's the idea. And then this one's just a line. Uh, I don't really know the best place to put this, but again, it's just a line. So maybe you can just draw a line like this. Whee! Some combination of just the x and y coordinates, because a line in the equation is just x plus y, x, y equals mx plus b or something. And it will learn the m's and the b's. Those are the weights. So yeah, this uh, spiral doesn't have any good mathematical formula that involves these inputs, so you just have to like overfit. The real answer is just use a ton of these things. I don't know, something like that. It would eventually figure it out. Slowly but surely. See how it needs time to converge? That's how long it took to, to like figure out what a cat is. You can imagine how much computational power it took to get good at this kind of stuff. And so there it's starting to figure out some weird mathematical formula for the spiral. It might get a little bit better or a little bit worse. But yeah, it's just a little random each time. That's what it means to be a neural network. You just learn some numbers figure out whether or not your output is blue or, blue or orange. It's very similar to determining whether or not the eyes were open or closed. That's just a binary output, one or zero kind of thing, positive or negative. Any questions about that? It's a fun little idea. And neural networks are powering this crayon.com idea. 
that machine learning thing. It's all neural networks at the end of the day, which is fun. All right, if we're good, I want to keep on trucking. I have just a few more slides, uh, just some more examples of artificial intelligence. So one thing that's very useful these days, uh, assuming you're an owner of like a mechanical factory, are factory robots, right? These kind of things that are helping to build cars. Because machines are really, really good at doing the same thing over and over again, right? They can be like, okay, here is my thingy. Here's my little lever arm or something. You can tell your factory robot to move that exactly five degrees, and it would do it for you, right? No human could move it exactly five degrees, right? That's beautiful. So it's very, very good. It's very, very precise. It's very hard to fail, right? If you just oil it enough, it'll always work. Uh, works faster than a human, more precisely than a human could. Uh, and so this is like taking humans from factory jobs because they're better than humans in, in some sense. Though they cost a ton of money, but then if you don't have to pay a salary, maybe it's better. So you can use artificial intelligence to do this kind of thing, to, to write a program that builds a car, that learns how to put all these bolts in the right place. That's interesting. Questions, comments about that? But again, there needs to be humans to repair the robots, make sure they're doing the right thing, service them. More examples. This is probably like the the standard example that people thought of back in the day. Does anybody remember the Watson uh, computer on Jeopardy? That was a pretty big thing uh, when it came out. But Watson, it's a supercomputer. Uh, it has some general intelligence. And it was made by IBM, and they started making it back in 2005. What it does is it's able to use what's called natural language processing. So it's able to like understand English. It learns how to understand English kind of thing to decipher questions and answer them using just like a giant database of information. So that's what Watson did. It went on Jeopardy. It was able to read the questions, understand the questions, and answer them with uh, very, very... Uh, good results. Like it beat the humans. Like here it was losing, but I think eventually it was on enough times it just always started like killing the, the humans. It was always much better. So definitely watch this video if you've never like watched Watson in action before. It's very, very cool to think that a computer can do this these days. But it figures out what the question was and it like it searches its offline database of like so many things. So when Watson went on Jeopardy, it had like all of Wikipedia on it. It was able to search through it in the blink of an eye. Much better than a human could, right? You can't memorize all of Wikipedia, but Watson could. And then it knows how to speak, it knows how to parse a sentence, it knows how to answer in the proper Jeopardy format, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, so what it was doing is it was breaking down text in the way that we learned how to do it in like grade school. Like, where's the subject? Where's the verb? What's it asking? That kind of thing. And it was able to take that parsed version of the sentence and like consult its databases and figure out what the answer should be. It's like, okay, the answer could be answer one to this question or answer two or answer three. And then it also had probabilities of what the answers could have been like. Okay, it was this answer with like a 10% probability. It was this answer with an 85% uh, probability. I don't know. And then it was this answer with like a 5% probability. And if it was confident enough on one of the answers, it would be like, okay, that's my answer. I'm going to bet money on it. And it would choose answer two, and usually it would get it correct. That's how Watson worked. Natural language processing. Very, very fun. Any questions, ideas, comments about that? It's fun to watch in action. That's kind of like general intelligence, right? Understanding speech. What Siri's good at, all that kind of stuff. All right, because my last example of the day is about uh, chess. There's some huge controversy in the chess world right now about a, a human cheating using a computer, right? So uh, chess and Go, by the way. Two games, two board games that are very, very famous for having computers be able to beat the best person. Okay, so let me tell you about chess first. 
So back in 1997, somebody finally built a program. A computer was finally able to beat a chess world champion. Okay, somebody who was considered the best of the time. Crazy, right? So finally we could make a program that would win more than a human could. Same with the game Go, if you've heard of that. Uh, so Go is a bit more complex. It has a bigger game. A lot of more states to think about, uh, and it was more recent, back in 2017, that somebody finally built an artificial intelligence program that will beat a human in the game Go. There's a video on that one if you want to watch it. Uh, yeah, how in the world do you learn? How does the computer learn how to play chess? How to play Go? Do you label states with, okay, you should move this way? Not really. Uh, Here's the secret. Here's how to learn how to play chess in a computer. Or learn how to play Go. Some other board game that has these that has this style. You have rules, right? There's rules for what you can do based on your current chess board, right? Like it's somebody's turn. They're allowed to move in this way or this way or this way. There's a bunch of options, right? Like here's your game board. Here's your chess board. You could, like whoever's turn it is, they can move here and the board will look like this, or they can move here this, or they can move here and the board will look like this, or maybe over here. So there's a bunch of options. And what the software does, how it learns, is the it can just try all the possibilities, right? Your program can just like, okay, I know that this, uh, this player could move this way, and then after that's done, the next player could move this way or this way or this way. So you just enumerate all those possibilities, all the ways that the game could be played out from here onwards. If you have enough memory to do that, you can imagine that this gets to be a very deep diagram, yeah, and also very wide. Uh, it's very clear how to play the game, so let's just play all the games. Play every possible game from the starting board. Yeah. Make some, some guesses as to what to do and see if you keep winning, see if you keep losing. A machine can learn without any prior information at all if it knows what the moves are. The idea is that the software can keep playing against itself and can figure out, okay, uh, this is going to be always the best way to, to, to make the move, something like that. Okay, so that's Chess and Go. It's very exciting. Uh, there's plenty more to talk about, but I want to make sure that I have talked about your essay before we leave today. So let's, uh, let's go there. And that'll be it for the day. So uh, here's your essay. It's going to be a larger one, but I'm asking you to copy and paste a lot of stuff off of the internet, so it shouldn't be too bad. It's going to be a thousand words, okay? Please read all of these directions. Even, the, even if I explain most of it, I want you to read all of it again, please, because uh, a lot of students have missed some of these requirements and gotten a bad grade because of it, okay? So definitely read the requirements. I'm requiring you to do quite a, a few things. Uh, so the idea is I want you to find fallacies on social media. I want you to find five fallacies total posted on social media. So go on Facebook, go on Twitter, go on Instagram, wherever you, need, wherever you would like to go, uh, and find fallacies in people's posts. Okay? This shouldn't be really that hard. Uh, there will be some digging, but I'll show you some good places to find them. Uh, there's plenty more fallacies than we talked about. Like you got your, your standard straw man, ad hominem, all that kind of stuff. There's a bigger list on Wikipedia. Go take a look. Uh, yeah, that's the idea. Uh, here are some sample ones that you could search for on Twitter that have probably have fallacies in their arguments. But yeah, here is my goal for you. Write an essay of at least a thousand words with this structure. You gotta have introduction and conclusion as you would normally. But here's how I want you to uh, format the body of your, uh, of your essay. So a bunch of paragraphs, at least five, right? because I want you to find five fallacies total, and I want you to do this. I want you to quote a social media post with a fallacy in it, whatever one you found. I want you to analyze why it had the fallacy. Explain it to me, that you understand it. Why and how it has the fallacy. Also say the name, right? This was ad hominem. This was straw man, and this is why. Okay? So definitely look at our lecture notes, look at Wikipedia, all that stuff. So just find five fallacies and analyze them. Tell me that they were which ones they were, and why they were that particular one. Because some of them we've seen could be multiple you know, of options. 
Uh, also, I have one last requirement. Uh, you can't just find five ad hominem fallacies. That's just people being mean to each other on the internet, right? That's really easy to find. So I will only let you use two ad hominem fallacy fallacies. You have to find three other ones, okay? At most, two ad hominem. That's all you get, okay? Does that make sense? So you're finding fallacies on the internet. And so here's like an example of, of one that I found just pretty easily. A lot of the time you can go and search for like a, a politician's Twitter and just look at the comments or look at their own words. So here is an example of a straw man fallacy on Twitter. So the vice president uh, last year was like congratulating women on International Women's Day. I want to honor the women who have been working because this was the middle of the pandemic, right? Risking their health to protect us, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then somebody replied to that saying, just the women? Guess that would be typical of you. I think I thank all who risked their lives for others, right? So this was... Uh, not just ad hominem, right? This was uh, this is a straw man fallacy, and this is what you would do. You would quote this tweet and be like, okay, this was a straw man fallacy because the, the vice president was not saying that she was not thankful for everyone who was working during the pandemic and risking their lives. She was just highlighting, because it was International Women's Day, the work of women. Does that make sense? So this, this commenter was putting words in the vice president's mouth and therefore it was a straw man fallacy. That's the kind of analysis that you would do. Does that make sense? That's what you would tell me. And that's how you would write your essay. Just find five examples of this kind of thing, uh, of fallacies on the internet, people making arguments that are in, invalid, incorrect, uh, and that will be your essay. So find five of those, analyze them. Don't find too many ad hominem ones and uh, write a thousand words total. This shouldn't be too bad because you're going to like quote all of those tweets, all of those posts that you find on Facebook or whatever. Okay, and so that'll be due week 12, so two weeks. Are there any questions uh, about that? Your biggest essay yet, I would say. But it should be fun. Fun to find people being wrong on the internet. Any questions about that? All right. In that case, I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about.